I'm going to call the uh, Sheboygan Common Council Committee of the Whole uh, meeting of Wednesday, October 12, 2011, to order. Uh, will we let's uh, do the roll call, please? Felt? Here. Horn? Here. Carlson? Here. Decker? Here. Hammond? Here. Hammond? Here. Heidemann? Here. Scott? Here. Kittleson? Here. Matichek? Here. Rinfleisch? Here. Riesler? Here. Sampson? I think he's on his way yet. Yeah. Uh, Van Akron? Excused? Vanderweel? Here. And Versi? Here. <laughs> 14 12. Present. Uh, let's all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, before we get into uh, tonight's agenda, President Rindfleisch would like to make an announcement. Thank you. Uh, it is with decidedly mixed emotions that uh, this evening I announced my resignation as alderperson effective this Friday. Uh, the good news is it's because it um, goes along with my chosen career path, having graduated with my master's degree in public administration this past December. I've been offered and I've accepted the position as village administrator, clerk, treasurer in Edgar, Wisconsin. And I begin my duties there on Monday. Uh, bittersweet moment though, because obviously there's still work left to be done in my hometown, the town that I uh, was born and raised in, uh, and uh, uh, love, and, um, and you know, to a large degree feel sad that we're not leaving work undone here, but, uh, um, you know, I thank you all, and it's been a pleasure working with you all, uh, and uh, all I ask is that you keep moving the city forward. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Good luck in your new position. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda, we have number four, approval of the minutes from 9-21-2011. Uh, so moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from 9-21-11. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Chair votes aye. <laughs> Next we have a public forum and agenda items. Anybody wish to speak at the public forum tonight? Anybody wish to speak? And for a third time, anybody wish to speak? Nobody for public forum. Chairman's comments, I have none. Uh, next, we have items for discussion and possible recommendation of the Common Council. Agenda item number seven, discussion and possible action regarding the City of Sheboygan's 20-year comprehensive plan update. Presentation by Vanda Wall and associate consultants. I'm gonna call on Chad Pelichek to uh, introduce our guests. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is a, the result, this presentation tonight, the first one is the result of a nine month planning process on the city's comprehensive plan update. Um, the last time the city uh, developed a comprehensive plan was in 2000 and that uh, plan, a lot of the recommendations brought forth in that plan have actually uh, successfully been completed. So. Uh, it was looked at as moving forward, we need to kind of have a 20 year vision on our uh, smart growth initiatives, land use process moving forward. And at that stage, we had applied for a grant through the Wisconsin Department of Administration uh, for $70,000 was awarded and we're matching that with some city funds and we did a process to bring on a consultant. You guys had approved a contract with Vandewell and Associates who's done a lot of planning work for the city over the past 20 years. Um, so what they're going to do tonight is go through a presentation. This is, we're treating this as a last kind of public participation uh, part of the plan under the state statute. We're required to have so many public participation events. Um, and after this, there's, they're going to go through a detailed process of how the city um, will be approving an ordinance and a resolution and getting this thing as an official document guiding the future for the 20, next 20 years. Um, so we have Jolena Presti and Jessica, and I can't say your last name. 
There you go. Um, with us, they, they're actually the two planners that worked on this plan. Um, we had developed a steering committee that was a lot of local residents and particular um, business leaders and moved and had them at the table for a number of events to uh, help us guide the development of the plan. So I had provided to all the older persons a um, executive summary of the plan. I, the document is too large for me to email, but you can go to their website and look at it in more detail going forward. So what I'm going to do is let them go through the plan, hit the high points, and then if there's specific questions afterwards, we'll be happy to discuss them. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jolina to start with. Hey, good evening, everyone. Evening. Well, thank you again for having us here tonight. Um, as Chad said, the, um, the purpose of this meeting is to provide a, an opportunity for um, public input and to present the plan um, to the council so you're not seeing it for the first time <clears throat> when it comes before you as we go through the formal adoption process. Um, as Chad mentioned also, we have, uh, our company has a long history in Sheboygan. We actually wrote the, um, your current plan that was adopted in, in 2000. And uh, we've also been working on redevelopment efforts here in the city since uh, the 1990s. So we're really excited to, um, to continue our work here and, and really move things forward. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. Go back, Julian. I, you were so on top of things. Here we go. Okay, um, so tonight I'm just gonna uh, briefly cover the purpose of the plan, uh, the process that we went through to develop it. Jolena's gonna talk about some key recommendations and then I'll describe the process that we're gonna go through to adopt it. So what is a, a comprehensive plan? Um, in 2000, the state passed legislation that said that um, every community in Wisconsin had to have a, a comprehensive plan that included nine required elements. Um, and they cover everything from land use, economic development, transportation, um, really runs the gamut of, of all the topics that a city um, needs to address. The city, as I mentioned, the city adopted its current plan in 2000, um, and the state requires communities to update their plan every 10 years. So this um, counts as that update process, um, and obviously uh, every about every 10 years is, is a good opportunity to uh, um, look at the recommendations that were in the plan, make sure they still reflect the direction that the community wants to take. Um, so that's, that's the process that, that we're going through right now. As far as the timeline, uh, we started this project back in January. We had a, a kickoff meeting. As Chad mentioned, we uh, did form a steering committee to help with the uh, planning process. It was really a, a diverse group of folks representing uh, a really a, a range of um, groups, including the arts community, um, neighborhood organizations, the business community, uh, the, the county staff, um, and, and other representatives were, were also very involved also. Um, and, and staff too, Chad and Steve, were both um, instrumental in really moving the, the process forward. So this group not also, or not only provided a sounding board for the recommendations uh, and, and helped us uh, sift through some of the public input, but we hope that they'll also be instrumental in um, beginning implementation right after adoption. We met with the committee three times, um, <clears throat> and then as part of the second meeting, we went out on a, a bus tour of the city. It gave us an opportunity to look at some of the redevelopment ideas, talk about them um, as a group, and really see what was going on. So if you got behind a slow-moving uh, city bus in May, I apologize uh, right now. So. But um, all, you know, as I mentioned, the, the committee was, was very helpful in moving the process forward. Okay, so as Chad mentioned also, we had uh, an extensive public outreach for this process. Um, we had a, a variety of uh, outreach opportunities, focus groups. Um, we also had some one-on-one -on -one interviews. We had a community vision workshop. And then Chad, Steve, and Jolena uh, hosted a booth at uh, the farmer's market in August and really had an opportunity to share some of the key recommendations uh, with the public and uh, get feedback on that also. Um, and uh, finally, throughout the, the plan process, we had a website that had uh, key documents uh, and, and meeting results that, that were posted so that people could go check it out. So um, as part of... Um, 
one of the, the products that we did for this plan, we took all of that input that we got at these meetings and um, with the help of the steering committee and staff, prepared a, a, a vision statement graphic. Um, and it's, it's over here too in a, a somewhat larger format. So a vision statement is really meant to be a, a um, collection of statements or a single statement that is intended to be an overall guide um, for the, the plan overall. Really, all the recommendations in the document should tie back to this recommendation, or should tie back to this vision statement and make sure, it's kind of a check-in, to make sure that, that the decisions moving forward are consistent with this overall vision um, for the future. So we got, as you can imagine, we got a lot of ideas um, from the public about you know, what should be done with the city in the future. Um, but these main ones um, were really what came to the top as the priorities for moving forward. I'm just gonna read those out quickly. Uh, the first one, build a self-sustaining economy. Two, focus on the city center. Three, revitalize our neighborhoods. Four, capitalize on Lake Michigan. <coughs> and five, cultivate the arts and uh, other cultural assets. And there's some more detailed recommendations on, under each one of those. And uh, you'll be able to find those in the plan in the relevant chapters also. But um, we really feel like, too, that this document, uh, it's, an, it's a nice 11 by 17 um, color graphic, can be used as a marketing piece um, to also boost the, the image of the city, too. So it can definitely serve a, a dual purpose. OK, so now we're going to um, transition a little bit into some of the key recommendations from the plan. The um, first one, and probably the one that at least city staff will reference the most, is the future land use map. Um, the future land use map is a, um, a host of different types of um, land use categories, everything from residential, commercial, industrial um, types of, of land uses. And it, it sets out um, how the city could develop over the next 20 to 25 years. Um, it's important because the state, state statutes say that all land use decisions that the city will make moving forward have to be consistent with that map. So what are some examples of land use decisions? So um, annexations, rezonings, conditional use permits. Um, so a lot of the things that the plan commission and, and the council too deal with um, have to now, going forward, be consistent with this map. Um, and we can talk about that uh, a little bit later in, in more detail. Um, but in general, and we do have some more, uh, we do have this map in three sections in the plan too, because it gets a little, a little uh, fuzzy, especially in the downtown. But you know, basically the idea for future growth um, is the um, future non-residential development, businesses, industry, job creation, job growth areas would be near the interstate corridor, obviously. Um, for access reasons, and then um, areas to immediately to the south and immediately north of the city um, would be identified for future residential development. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, so with that, going to turn it over to Jolina. Um, we'll be happy to take any questions at the end, or if anybody has anything right away on the topics that I addressed, I can certainly take them now too. But, okay. Any questions? I forgot to mention before, we are on live television tonight, so we'll need our mics. Great, thanks. I'll go through the um, key recommendations now beyond the land use, future land use map. So Jessica's going to put up a larger version of this map, but it's what we call the opportunities and focus area map. And like the vision statement, this is a, um, a graphic or a map that we think really can serve well to stand alone on its own. You can have this out as your, especially city staff and the mayor can go out and use um, this as a tool to say, here's where we're focusing on. And as you might have guessed from some of the categories Jessica was mentioning from the vision statement, um, the community, the steering committee, and the, the city staff really guided us to understand that they're focused on revitalizing the core. And so the focus areas um, that are obviously hard to read here, but um, downtown is a key area. Uh, the lakefront uh, where the Pentair, former Pentair site, uh, the Willow Creek Business Center, um, which in encompasses this area here, um, Indiana Avenue, and we'll talk about these a little bit as we go through, um, Calumet Drive, North 15th Street, Michigan Avenue, 
um, Taylor Drive and South Business Center, uh, or South Business Drive, sorry. Uh, those are areas that are very big and encompass um, large parts of your community. So obviously even with targeting these, you're going to have to focus on specific projects, knowing you know, constraints with budgets and, and staff time and uh, volunteer support. Um, so as, as the city moves forward in implementing this, um, you really have to figure out where you wanna spend your energy. But this is a way at least of organizing uh, the key areas. So um, this actually follows along with the executive summary. Uh, we wanted to pull out what are the key things or the key initiatives, if you're gonna get started now over the next five to 10 years, where should energy be focused based on the input we received? Uh, promoting infill and redevelopment. So obviously this example here um, is the Calumet Drive and 15th Street. And what we're talking about here is really um, looking at a land use pattern that maybe has shifted and you know former commercial area that maybe isn't as thriving, um, where are areas that you could do new projects and um, also connect to the neighborhoods and improve the area overall. Uh, the purple bubble up above is employment infill, so another location within your community to put appropriate uh, business development for employment growth. Another uh, key recommendation or initiative is spurring economic development and job creation. Um, I just threw in this graphic from a marketing piece that's on your city website uh, called the Fresh Tech um, Marketing Initiative that encompasses the Willow Creek Business Park all the way to the, the Lakeside Business Center where the Pentair site is located. Um, but I used this because I wanted to, to illustrate how as a community you can continue to develop the Sheboygan brand or rebrand and, and think about new ways to advance economic development in the community and, and maybe differentiate yourself not just from your neighbors, but throughout the region and the state. Um, focusing on targeted economic development growth areas, um, this is just another graphic that shows, you know, you've been spending a lot of time over the past 20, 25 years working on South Pier, working on downtown, now growing beyond that, um, working on Calumet Drive, North 15th, as I mentioned, uh, Michigan Avenue was an area that people really brought up as being, you know, it's, it's basically what I would consider your downtown, but it's still still separate, so how to focus a little bit more energy there and, and work on that like you have in other areas. And then the Taylor Drive area, which you've already been um, underway in redeveloping, but continuing that. Then um, focusing on targeted economic development growth areas, so advancing things like the Fresh Tech um, Initiative, Regional Foods um, is another initiative that the city's been working on in partnership with the Sheboygan County EDC. Um, developing the Willow Creek Business Park or advancing uh, the recommendations that come out of that and are adapted. And then maximizing the Lakefront Business Center. Um, these were really seen as the key areas of opportunity now. I mean, there's, there's plenty of areas that could use other investment, but if you really wanted to make a difference in the next five to 10 years, these were the areas people felt really should be focused on. Um, of course, it's important for this community to further continue to enhance the lakefront and the riverfront. Um, that's been a very strong initiative that you've been undertaking for many, many years. Uh, but continue to attract new development, find new ways to appeal to residents as, as well as you've done as appealing to visitors. Um, I think we heard that people want to make sure it also is a very strong residential draw. And I think that's an area that we can continue working on in the future. And then facilitating a healthy community, and that means a lot of different things, but I think um, one thing that's come out of this is really healthy living in terms of foods, um, being able to bike to work, walk to work, uh, people being able to live in an environment that is healthy and sustaining. Um, that, again, ties into the enhancing the transportation system. Um, you have a great um, effort at your county level, and it was important, many people at the table felt it was important to make sure that the regional plan or the, the countywide plan is implemented, and then that is actually played out in the city of Sheboygan as well. So that was important. Another thing that's come up that you probably wouldn't be a surprise to you is the idea of advocating for the I-43 interchange at Indiana Avenue. And um, people felt that in order to revitalize Indi Indiana Avenue, which has been a big um, discussion over the last couple of years, something that's really needed, and this is coming from the business as well as residential community, is some sort of um, additional interchange to make that area thrive. Um, continuing to provide high quality public services establishing uh, citywide broadband services came out as an important issue, addressing future sanitary sewer capacity and uh, water system improvements. 
strengthening neighborhoods. So as we're talking about the commercial corridors and opportunities for business growth, we're also talking about finding ways to improve your existing neighborhoods, your historic neighborhoods, the, the core of um, this community, and finding ways to make sure people want to live in the city. Um, we heard not just with um, our efforts, but also the, the young professionals uh, focus group that was held by the EDC. Um, it was really interesting because I think people think everybody wants to, you know, move out to Sheboygan Falls or, you know, people are moving out. And that's not really the case. What they heard in that event was people want to live in Sheboygan. They just need to figure out or we need to have more opportunity for that. So more rental housing that isn't, um, that is desirable to, you know, young professionals that maybe work in the outline area, but they want to live in your most urban environment here. And then that, I guess I jumped ahead, um, diversifying the city's housing stock. Um, I just threw the photo of uh, the capsule building on here as an example because that is a project that, you know, it's been underway. It's, you know, we're trying to, to match the right developer to fill that need that I just said. Um, but there's other areas and throughout the plan we talk about areas where you might be able to infill with additional market rate housing um, to kind of diversify your housing stock and either keep the people here that are here or draw people. In, that are gonna work in the region. And then something that was also important to this group was advancing the tradition of rich arts, cultural facilities, and events. Um, the partnering with business and chamber of commerce was important. And then something that came up that I, I haven't necessarily heard in other communities is the idea of preparing an inventory of what's available culturally. It sounded like, you know, there's really a lot of people out there doing different things. Some people are, you know, putting lists together, but there's really not a, all-encompassing inventory and they felt like that would really help sell the community it goes back to your branding as well as just let people know in one location what's going on so that seems like an achievable um, activity once somebody takes charge of you know doing that and then Jessica's just going to wrap up on the next steps and then we'll take questions oh yep um, so statutes identifies a, a fairly uh, prescriptive process for adopting the comprehensive plan. Um, it will, the, the plan will go to council on the 17th. Uh, they will recommend it back to plan, the plan commission. Um, the plan commission will make a, a recommendation by resolution um, for the council to adopt the plan. Um, and then we have to go through a 30 day uh, public review period. And during that period we have to distribute the uh, draft plan to uh, adjacent communities and to the state and to the county. And um, following that 30 day period, the, uh, the council can, or it is required to hold a public hearing and then they can adopt it any time after that. Um, so tentatively we've, we've um, identified December 5th for that public hearing. Um, and then after that we would distribute then the, the final adopted plan in, in case there were any changes to um, those same surrounding and overlapping communities again. So, um, and then we will immediately commence with, uh, with implementation. And, and a lot of those implementation ideas were um, the ones that, that Jolena talked about in, those, um, the, uh, in her section of the presentation. And they're also in the executive summary that, that um, was distributed. So this is our steering committee. Um, and, and we really can't thank them enough for the, the time and the effort they, uh, that they put in. Obviously, it's not riveting stuff to all of us, only us um, planners, and uh, we really appreciate the, the time that they put in, so I wanted to acknowledge them. Any questions from the council? Uh, Chad, do we, you need a, a motion from this body tonight? We had it down for discussion and possible action. Yeah, I don't think we need a, I don't think we need a motion from <coughs> for this particular item because okay. there's going to be a resolution coming into council anyway right. as part of the state statute. All right. But one thing I just wanted to say in, in closing is um, th this process and I Jolina really hit on some of the key redevelopment efforts in the city's inner core is where we need to do a lot of work. But we also had a stakeholder, a stakeholder committee meetings with, they did with our surrounding townships and gained a lot of interest and you'll see that in the plan um, as to what the town of Sheboygan's feels were and what the town of Wilson's feels were and some of our 
you know, future expansion because some of our industrial expansion obviously is going to happen to the south and there's some key pieces of property that have been identified south of the Sheboygan Business Center, the current business center for the industrial part. Um, and then kind of some residential stuff maybe to the north and some areas that are either in the city or very near the city. So even though the presentation focused a lot on the core and our downtown. You know, there is some expansion out into those areas because those are where uh, obviously industrial is going to happen versus in the center core as it had in the past. So that's, you know, obviously a movement that's moving forward. So it, the plan does identify all that. And I, you know, if you have time, I would recommend that you go to their website and you don't have to read the whole plan, but just scan through some of those key areas because those are going to be the initiatives that we're going to be pushing forward when developers come to us and when you know we're looking for new opportunities um, to really branch out for some of those areas as well so this is kind of our 20-year guiding uh, principle moving forward as a community and in our department alone as well as other departments will be referring to this as we move forward thanks Chad thank you thank you for the presentation ladies thank you. Uh, we'll move on to item number eight on the agenda <clears throat> and that is a discussion and possible action regarding Schuchert Farms Conservation Plan, presentation by uh, Grafe Consultants. I'll call on Chad again to make the introduction. Oh. <clears throat> have to do some technology switch over here um, for a second PowerPoint presentation, but while Carolyn is getting that together, I'll kind of give you an introduction on that plan. Um, that this is the plan that was approved by the council with a forty thousand dollar grant from the DNR, and I just want to recognize in the in the back of the room is Stacy Roan from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, who's been kind of a spearheader of these projects at the DNR level, and approached the city and said, "We have money. We want to do projects. Are you willing to be the sponsor of these projects?" So, uh, you know, we we thank the DNR moving forward. Especially, this is a smaller project at forty thousand, but we have this. Uh, habitat restoration project under contract now with SEH for 450,000 with up to 5 million of improvements being hap happening next summer as part of the Sheboygan River project. So we're, we're proud that the DNR is a partner in this on, on this project. But what this project really was, was to look at the Schuchert Farms. The DNRs um, has, they have a couple technical advisory <coughs> committees that identified the Schuchert property as a uh, key property to study from a conservation standpoint and, and figure out what's happening there because it's a very prestigious, it's a very prestigious piece of property with a lot of, um, you know, there, there's environmental corridors, there's, there's challenges with developing that, and, we, and we're, this really turned out to be a project that allows us to kind of guide our development moving forward. So what, what we did was we went out on an RFP for this and we hired Grafe um, out of Milwaukee, another consultant that uh, we've worked with in the past, and they've put together a conservation plan for that, and, and Carolyn's going to go into uh, kind of their findings on what they found. They spent a, a very short time out there da gathering a lot of data on that property. Um, we've got a lot of data from the DNR, and there was some stuff that came forward that we weren't aware of, and it's it's going to have to be played into the whole development picture as we move forward. So I'll let Carolyn kind of go through her presentation, and then if you have specific questions, um, we'll try to answer them as well. What we're going to be looking for under, under this one, though, is a recommendation to the council on this plan so we can get this wrapped up, submit our final invoicing to the DNR, get our funds reimbursed, and close out this project. Thanks, Chad. Are you going to advance the slide? Oh, sure. Thank you again. I'm Carolyn S. Swine. I'm with Grafe. Uh, we had some partners on this project as well. Our aquatic expert looking at uh, Willow Creek and, and the fish that are there is from Ecological Research Partners. And then our wildlife expert is Western Great Lakes Bird and Bat out there looking at uh, the different reptiles as well as birds. Go ahead. Uh, I assume most of you are familiar, but the Shukart property is 177 acres. It's on the west side, just west of Taylor Drive. Very unique. It's unique to have a property this large 
uh, as an environmental feature. It has been farmed over the years. It has a creek going through the middle, uh, as well as some very high quality environmental features to the north. And as, as you may or may not know, it has some very interesting topography. I think most of, the, most of us have been around the perimeter of the site, but actually when you're walking through it, it has some unique features. So I'll walk through what we looked at, as Chad mentioned. Uh, we only had one month. Uh, normally these studies take several months, uh, so we did gather a lot of data that was uh, really just over a few weeks, but with the understanding there's other data out there that we used as well. So what was the purpose? Well, the purpose was to identify the types and qualities of habitats. So we looked at the plant communities, we looked at forestry, as I mentioned, Willow Creek, uh, the actual habitat of the water, as well as which uh, fish species were there, and then we looked at wildlife, which includes birds, uh, the different reptiles that are on the, on the site, as well as some mammals. Uh, we wanted to look at this to determine, well, which areas make sense to protect? There's a lot of areas, but which ones are we protecting as is? because they're high quality right now, which ones are we gonna protect? But they need some restoration, they need some improvement. We also wanted to take a look at which areas make sense to develop based on topography, and again, uh, which areas might have the, the few, fewest environmental constraints. And all of this is based on not just our field survey, but input from the city, the DNR, TAAC stands for a Technical Advisory Committee that we worked with. They are currently looking at the entire Sheboygan River corridor, the area of concern through the DNR. So they had a lot of input and a lot of data they provided and a lot of studies that, that have already been done. So start out with plants. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail because there's a lot of very technical detail that our environmental staff have provided. But overall, there are 31 different plant communities for this particular parcel. Uh, if you look at the map, the, the blues are some wetland categories. The green are our uplands, which include some of the forested areas. And then there are a lot of invasive species. So species that are taking over essentially are good quality species that are good for the, the habitat, the birds and things that are there, so we've identified those. And forestry, there are six forest stands or large forest areas. Most of those have a fair overall health. And again, there are some invasive areas that we are looking to, to clean up. So recommendations there. Uh, what we're hearing is that most of the land needs some kind of management, and that, that varies from going in and getting rid of invasive species to making sure we have some new opportunities for those areas to actually grow, and, and augmenting, which means allowing some natural generation of some of those plants that are, that are healthier plants. Go ahead. And for forestry, again, some of it's been degraded. There's some very, very aggressive uh, invasive species that what happens essentially, um, I'm not the expert on this, so uh, it's easier for me to understand by explaining, it creates a lot of shade, which means all the new uh, sprouts can't grow. And so the healthy plants that you want on the site are getting choked out essentially by the invasives. And so we need to clean that up. Uh, what, what this leads to is if you have a lack of ground cover because a lot of these trees that aren't the high quality trees are taking over, uh, we have a lot of erosion because there aren't plants that are the healthy ones that we want maintaining the ground. So the ground is washing away when, it, when we have some of the large storms and it affects your habitat. So forestry would be to remove a lot of those invasive species and there's a little more detail obviously in the report. We wanna enhance uh, the higher quality forest and those species and then establish that understory so we do have the higher quality plants that will uh, help with the erosion and, and the habitat. Uh, in the wetlands there, as I mentioned, there's several different ones, A through E, and you can see they're scattered throughout the site. We have some higher quality ones to the north. Uh, we have several to the south. Uh, for orientation, this is the railroad that creates a very uh, strong division in the site. So you have the southern portion and then the northern portion. This is Indiana down here. I won't go through all the details, but there are recommendations for, again, maintaining the quality of many of those wetlands because for some of those, we have found uh, groundwater seeps. So there's water coming up from the ground, which is actually the best thing for Willow Creek because it keeps it cooler. And I'll talk a little bit about that because that's actually a very critical component. And so those areas need to be protected. And then for wildlife, 
55 bird species. I, I thought that was a very high number, but they've gone out, uh, they've been able to track, they listen to the sounds and they can tell you what kind of birds they are. Uh, there are migratory birds that come from the north, stop at the Shukert property, and then continue to the south. So again, it's a very important property for that as well. Uh, six of those 55 are considered species of greatest conservation need or special concern. So there are some regulations usually that uh, you should protect them as much as possible. There are nine mammal species. Those are what you'd expect. There's deer, there's, uh, well, the turkey are considered the birds, but there's uh, raccoons and squirrels, so there's nothing extraordinary in, in that area, but there are quite a few. Uh, and then there's 16 insect and invertebrate species as well. So what we're looking at for implications here, uh, we need a healthy uh, plant community and a healthy habitat for all of those birds to continue breeding and surviving here as well as all the wildlife. So again, you're going to hear me say we need to get rid of a lot of those invasive species and look at how we can uh, allow some of the, the higher quality plants to regenerate. And essentially the, the last item here is looking at a management plan. Ultimately we need a management plan that identifies over time how to get rid of those invasive species, how to regenerate the plants that you want, and that'll take quite some time. Uh, but again, it's through a management process. And then aquatic. Uh, we looked at several categories of aquatic. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is water quality. Uh, the quality itself is actually fairly good. Uh, we have some issues when there are storms. Uh, we have a lot of water flow that comes through. The temperature fluctuates uh, to a fair amount. Again, the railroad is here. So the piece north, uh, the temperature warms up, but then it becomes very cool as you get closer to Taylor Drive and come down towards uh, Indiana. And again, that's because uh, we did find a lot of these uh, seeps that come out. Essentially, it's the water coming from below the ground that's a cooler temperature. But you can tell by the pictures, and you'll see some more in the upcoming slides, uh, that there is a lot of erosion. And so we need to look at how to improve that. And some of that isn't just on this property, but some of that is coming from outside of the Shukert property. So getting to the stream flow, which again is causing some of that erosion. Uh, not luckily, but we did have some storms in August. So our, uh, Tim was able to actually monitor the increase in water flow right after those storms. It peaks, you can see, you know, I don't need to go through all the details, but you can see the very high peaks, that's right after a storm, but then it recedes very quickly. So the water is moving through very quickly. So some of the implications, uh, we're talking about, they call them flashy flows. Uh, they're causing the, the bank erosion, which is increasing actually the width of the river of the creek. And as I mentioned, some of that's not from the site. Some of that is from upstream. You have uh, impacts from obviously the highway and other pieces to the north, as well as other runoff within the area coming from impervious surfaces. And the implications for that, as I mentioned, it's, it's widening your channel. You can see areas where a lot of the tree roots are exposed. Uh, there are a couple areas where uh, he said it's not going to take much time and you're going to have a, more debris falling in. Uh, they call them little woody debris areas where you see trees have already fallen into the creek and it starts to block the flow of the water. In some cases, those form habitats, but if you have too much of that building up, uh, it affects the, the quality of that habitat. So ultimately, we just want to look at how to reduce that amount of erosion. And so habitat, as I mentioned, the fish need to uh, have the flow, have the, there's a lot of oxygen, the actual quality of the water is very good. Uh, and I would say, although there's a lot of concern, this creek is very healthy compared to most within our region. I think there's a lot of places that would like the quality of Willow Creek. Uh, the, the, really the goal here is to maintain that and then improve it to restore it. Uh, we understand that there's you know, people that are aware of some of the fishing opportunities here, and so you want to think long term, what are those opportunities? Are those opportunities for recreation uh, as well as for the environmental impact? And so I mentioned those debris dams, we want to make sure those uh, are, are removed. And you can see it, there's different characteristics of the, the creek. Uh, looking at the fish, uh, there's some previous studies that we looked at. 
there is a dominance of, of fish species that are usually found in more marginal trout streams, although the stream is designated by the DNR as a class two trout stream, which is a, a high quality stream. We want to make sure that we can uh, provide the habitat for those fish to actually reproduce. Salmon was observed in the creek in 04, 06 and uh, this year, and trout has been observed upstream in 2006. So that tells you the, the quality is high. So we want to make sure that we protect it and, and, and improve it. I won't go through all this, but these are all the different fish that are actually in the creek. And then there are uh, six different aquatic recommendations. Some of those are on-site, some are off-site. Uh, and the purpose of a lot of these recommendations is to allow the city and the DNR to be able to get grant funding to come in and actually implement some of these improvements so you're going to help the quality of, of the creek but not just the creek but the actual entire habitat. So project one is looking at the flow restoration as I talked about you want to look at retention outside of the creek so you start to flow, uh, slow down that flow of water rushing into the creek and you can do that with infiltration. Uh, project two looking at the culverts and the road crossings that are currently on the site as well as any that would be proposed and removing some of those culverts that are undersized, which would allow fish to uh, actually uh, pass through those areas and move a little bit to the north of the site as well. There's a little um, offshoot to the north. Project three, we call those the large wood debris areas, just managing that so you can improve the water flow. Uh, the bank stabilization, there are various different techniques to reduce the continued erosion uh, and infiltration will help with that as well. So making sure the water's not always flowing right into the creek. Uh, looking at the grade control and the riffle enhancement, which is right in the, the bed itself, working with the improving the water flow. And then ultimately a monitoring program, which looks off-site as well as on the Shuker property, uh, have these implementation items improve the quality, stabilized it in some cases, so you can monitor that over time. So ultimately what this led to was what we're calling a concept plan. Uh, we looked at all those areas that were identified as very high quality, and the highest quality, which you can see are this purple color here, uh, those are uh, to the north, those are uh, sedge metal, very high quality plant materials, and then in the, the, the steep slope here, right off of Taylor Drive, there are those seeps I mentioned. So there's water coming through the ground, which is very valuable to the site. Uh, also, there are a lot of permitting issues that say you can't, you can't develop there anyway, besides it's very steep. So we want to make sure those are preserved. And then everything that shows up in this blue and darker blue color throughout the uh, meanders, I know it's, there's a lot of information to see on here. Those are all areas that should be protected but they also need enhancement and restoration. All those things I talked about, the different species and some of the water flow, uh, the stream bank to the creek, which you can see coming through here. And then uh, if you look at the preservation, 116 acres in option one uh, are recommended for preservation, which is 65% of the site. That's a significant portion. And much of that is because it's either land we aren't really permitted to develop or there are constraints do due to some of the slopes and the permitting that would be required. So that allows 61.1 acres available for development. You're gonna see the majority of that land is along Indiana Avenue. You have very easy access from that road. The topography is much easier to work with. You would have easier access through uh, uh, circulation. And then there's a large one in the central area, which is now in a field, which is the 14.2 acres, uh, as well as some perimeter pieces that you can see just around the axis here would be adjacent to development that already exists off of Taylor Drive. And then there are two smaller pieces immediately north of that railroad. Uh, the railroad is elevated. Uh, we are not able to connect between the north and the south because it would be a very significant expense. It's not wide enough for a, a truck to get through or emergency vehicle to get through. So we are looking at access to the north only from Taylor Drive coming down and access from the south would come off of Indiana. There are two purple access points. The yellow access points would be for pedestrian or bike paths only uh, that would allow people to connect to the other trail, especially from the west. You could connect to the old plank trail. You'd come around that could allow you to come through the site. Uh, the sites uh, immediately north of the railroad are a little more challenging because of their size. 
So you would be restricted in the, the size of the development and associated parking, but they're perfect for somebody who's looking to be, you know, within a green sustainable development that's part of their mission. Uh, they could easily come in and, and access, uh, the employees could access a trail system that we propose so you could hike throughout the whole site. Uh, if you look at this, uh, the, the lines that are shown here, there's a very steep uh, topography right here coming off of Taylor Drive, so that is a little bit challenging. And then as you go to the northern parcel, uh, there is a ridge. Right there, you're on the highest point of the ridge, and you have woods on either side. Again, you'd have to restrict how wide the, the street is or the road is to allow the cars and the trucks in there. And again, it would be ideal for a business that's looking for, again, this green development. They look at the scenic views. It's a very beautiful site. You, you still have very easy access to the interstate. And as Jolena mentioned, off of Indiana, if the proposed interchange goes through, I think that's ideal for uh, attracting businesses to this site. Uh, for recreation, we've looked at, as I mentioned, the trail system, the, the bike ped trails that would come in, and ultimately there could be some active recreation. Uh, there's an opportunity here for some active or recreational fishing, and so that's something that could be marketed as a bit of a tourism, and we have quite a few fishermen in, in our office, uh, one who grew up in Kohler, and he said, you know, if that opens up, I I'm coming. So he knows about the quality of the salmon and some of the trout that are there. Uh, but it does have some constraints. As I mentioned, we can't connect north and south, uh, but because of the topography, the ridge lines, and some of the DNR permitting that'll be triggered, we did want to look at another option if it becomes so cost uh, prohibitive to develop this one. I'll let Chad go to the second option. We did look at how much could be developed to the north. We have the three perimeter sites with the majority in the center being preserved. Now that only makes sense if you can come up with grants or somebody uh, provides grants for conservation easement or long-term deed restriction on the site. So again, that requires some additional research or partnering with the DNR, some of the conservancy groups. As part of that technical advisory committee, uh, there were some ideas uh, suggested for how additional funding could be brought in because it has to balance the investment that was made but then the lack of uh, money that you're gonna get out from only having your development down here. I will say the prime site is really along Indiana because of the access, the large size of it. You could do a couple larger tenants here or you could have several smaller tenants. So that one's actually pretty flexible. Uh, infiltration opportunities are these little gray black areas are, are really a suggestion for depending on what kind of development would occur that's where they would best be located. We had some of our engineers take a look at that. So it's, a, it's an issue that needs to be discussed as this plan moves forward, but there are two options on the table. This one has 38.5 acres for development with 78% being preserved. And the other constraints, as I mentioned, no linkages north and south would be the same. So that's where we're at. We are submitting that after we get our last set of edits from the DNR. And if there are any questions, I think Chad and I could try to take those. Any questions? Or do you have other comments, Chad? I just have another comment. Yeah. What I want to say is um, what we're really, what the two options that she presented is, is it's by all means not hindering any development opportunities on the north side, but as a community, we are outreaching with some of the key partners through the DNR and some other federal agencies to see if we can leverage some other funds about the, with the idea of trying to uh, recoup what the city has spent on the north side of the parcel. And if we could get um, grant money to recoup those funds and look at putting that in preservation with just recreational trails and really focus ourselves on developing the south side. Now that's not to say we're not taking people through there. We've had a couple tours with a couple uh, development options and the right development could go in that north side. It's just that getting utilities and infrastructure in there is, is, cost, is costly. Um, so the idea is is let's try to focus our efforts on south of, north of Indiana, south of the railroad tracks, those 38 acres, um, and kind of build up some equity and some revenues, and then move forward at that stage, and, at the, and also work on trying to obtain some uh, funding to see if we can uh, recoup our costs and really focus in on developing the south side. 
So that's really where we're at. We're, we're, we're exploring a number of federal uh, Great Lakes initiative um, opportunities that are out there. Um, we're going to probably be applying for some grants come the first of the year to see about doing some enhanced conservation on that north side, um, see where that goes, and then we're still open for business and taking people and interested developers and submitting. We just submitted this on the Milwaukee market, um, this development concept to uh, if there is any kind of green developers for the northern parcel. So it, like Carolyn said, it's going to be the key. It, it's going to, we're going to have to identify the key user for that north parcel. Um, it's not going to be an industrial or anything that's got a lot of uh, heavy traffic because the road construction is going to be challenging. So if anybody has any specific questions or anything, we can um, answer them. Otherwise, what we're looking for is a uh, recommendation to the full council to adopt the plan. Um, I, this isn't the full plan. It's really the executive summary. The full plan is like 200 some pages um, with a lot of scientific information in it. That's way over my head. Um, but you know, we, I've sent out how do, you can access that plan as well um, and further look into it. But uh, it's really, this is gonna be kind of our guiding process moving forward with developing this, this large chunk of land. I have a question from Alderman Hammond. Actually, I would move that we um, make a positive recommendation to the council um, to accept this document. So motion and a second, uh, second by Alderman Versi, I believe. Under discussion, I do have a couple. Uh, I do have a couple questions, just so I can visualize this a little better. Under the 14.2 acre site, uh, as far as giving me an idea of what the size of that would be, <coughs> could you give? Would that uh, would be that be, for example, like the size of the, the 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 Taylor Drive area where Festival Foods is? I mean, I, I'm having a hard time visualizing how big 14.2 acres is. It, I would say it's probably it probably is the area where the Taylor Drive uh, Taylor Shopping Center Taylor Heights Shopping Center Festival Foods kind of that area Culver's. Okay. Yeah, that's about a 14 acre parcel. Okay, that but that would include. The Festival of Foods and Culver's, not the entire Taylor I don't think so. district there. What was it? I would say Festival, Festival, the shopping center, maybe Culver's, Napa, that kind of area. And then the 31.7 acres, can you give us a little visual, visual, visualization of what 31 acres would be compared to what's kind Double of that. developed in the city right now? <laughs> Double that. It's about, it's about twice the yeah, I understand that, but something that's something that's developed. I would say you might be taking into like, concept the concept the mall and the Shopko property as okay. well as the Taylor Heights and the okay, good, good. Alderman Sampson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any questions. I just have a, a, a comment. Um, it's absolutely amazing that you folks were able to get this done within 30 days. Uh, that's a lot of information, a lot of detail. So my hat's off to everybody involved getting that uh, this whole thing put together. So thank you for all the hard work that you guys have done. This is this is tremendously. This is amazing. We've all been walking the site every day. <laughs> thank you, Alderman Sampson. We have a motion and a second. Uh, why don't we call the roll on this one? Belt. Aye. Warren. Aye. Carlson. Aye. Decker. Aye. Hammond. Aye. Hammond? Aye. Heineman? Aye. Kopp? Aye. Kittleson? Aye. Matichek? Aye. Brinfleisch? Aye. Reisler? Aye. Sampson? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Percy? Aye. 15 ayes. Motion carries. <clears throat> Next we have on the agenda items number 9 and 10, uh, the documents from uh, Dimple Adams. Uh, Mrs. Adams called me this afternoon and said she was ill. She's having some health issues and couldn't be here tonight, so she asked me to ask the committee whether they'd be willing to hold these two documents until the next committee of the whole meeting so she'd have an opportunity to be here and address the, the committee. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to hold uh, items number 9 and 10 to the next meeting. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Chair votes aye. Uh, before we go into item number 11, let's take a five minute break so that the television cameras can be turned off. Why don't we reconvene about uh, 
Uh, 10 to 8.